first module in the Hidden Luxor series, and it is the longest one. But that's because Karnak deserves it. Um, it's a huge, huge site. Now, I haven't done every single thing of it. There is more, but I have done an awful lot. So, the first thing you'll see when you go to Karnak is the visitor centre. And they have this dinky little model of the whole of the temple, which is really excellent for showing you where things all are and fit together. It's been very, very well done. Um, I love things like this. Now you can see here the uh, main avenue of sphinxes that leads into the temple and the first pylon um, and then going through to the, the second pylon. You've also got the, um, the ramps that have been newly discovered um, leading up to the embankment. Um, there's a lot of excavation going on in this area, so it is changing a bit. So, you come in the central axis of the temple, and the first thing that we're going to look at is the mud brick scaffolding. Um, we can talk a little bit about Sheshonk and the Bible. Um, contrast relief styles, uh, the obelisks and the sanctuary. So here we have the key, the sphinx and the first pylon. Now the key is the square bit in front of the avenue of sphinxes there. Um, and this is where they would have had a, a canal leading up to the temple where Pharaoh's barge would have come along and landed and Pharaoh would have disembarked. Now if you want to get good photos of the sphinxes, the second one furthest away from you on the left is the best one and it has a really pretty bush by the side of it um, and it's the best condition, it's got the best picture of the Pharaoh. It's Amenhotep III in between the paws of the ram's headed sphinxes. Ram's headed because the, the god Armen that this temple is dedicated to, that's one of his symbols. Now this is the gateway itself leading into the first court. You can see there we have a restored column of Tahaka and we've got some other bits and pieces and sphinxes and so forth lying around and you can see the second pylon. Now behind the first pylon, this is actually quite interesting because this pylon um, wasn't properly finished and I'm sure there's a technical term for it but it's lumpy bumpy. Now if you actually look, do you see that column there? That one has been dressed, the stone has been dressed. But this column here is still lumpy bumpy and you can get from that the picture that what they did is put these huge things up and then they dressed the stone while it was in situ and made the shapes. So we've got the back of the pile on there was never finished because um, time proceeded, whatever, the pharaoh never got to finish it. So we have mud brick scaffolding that was left in place. And they used, mud brick was cheap and easy, and it was very easy to build nice ramps going up to take all these stones up to the top. And this mud brick scaffolding obscured that last pillar, so that's why it was never finished. So it's very uh, illustrative of the building techniques that we used at the time and very handy for us Egyptologists. Now, um, we have one of the few bits of the Bible um, here. The uh, uh, Mostly in the Bible it talks about Pharaoh and stuff like that and it doesn't tell, you, tell us who, but here we have got it identified. So this is the victory over Rehoboam and it's uh, dedicated, it's written about in First Kings and Second Chronicles. And very often when you go to the temple and you stand in this area, um, you'll find a load of very um, sort of, you know, often Korean churches standing there all looking at it and they're all sort of terribly thing because the Bibles are up there. And it's uh, worth the, the time when Solomon's 
temple was robbed of all its treasures and these were brought back to Egypt in uh, triumph and it's just outside the first courtyard this is the gate here and to the right there that is the area where the um, the depiction of this biblical scene is done now if you look through that gateway you can see this extremely nice colossal statue um, going past that colossal statue you then go into the hyperstar hall now the hyperstar hall was actually um, built by a succession of pharaohs starting with Ramses I then Seti I and then Ramses II you can hear see the clear story windows um, on the central axis so what you would have got in this temple area was these huge columns sort of making you feel terribly small and insignificant and shafts of sunlight coming through these um, windows that would have made it almost like a laser show because it was all brightly coloured and it would have highlighted pieces of the columns and the walls as you went round. Now, Seti I uh, took a lot of time trouble about his carvings and the back of the second pylon and the um, south wall are done by him. Sorry, the north wall are done by him. Um, but Ramses II did all the rest of the carving. Now, he went for quantity, not quality. So his carvings are done in what is called incised relief. And Seti did his carvings in raised relief. So here we have Seti's raised relief carvings. This is a scene of Seti at his coronation. There's the god, god Thoth with his Ibis head writing Seti's name in the Tree of Life. Um, now you see all the tree there, all the branches are very interwoven. Now what they've done is they've left the um, figures standing proud and hammered away the background so they can get a much more sort of 3D kind of image there. And all those branches, it looks really like a living tree. So that's Seti's version. Now look at Ramses. Now doesn't it look so boring and 2D um, because the, 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 you can't get that interweaving of the branches there. It's been dug in so he has wanted to get it finished really really quickly and it just doesn't have the quality of Seti's carvings. Now the next part of, of the main part of the temple that you go through is to the obelisk. Originally there were six pairs there. Um, the, uh, uh, the topmost is the third one. So, uh, the topmost is the first ones have gone. So what we're left with is one of Hatshepsut's ones standing proud there. Um, it was walled up by Thutmosis the third, and that has preserved the carving very very nicely on it. Now here we've got round the sanctuary area, we can see two of the obelisks there. And this is Thutmosis III showing what a magnificent commander he was and how he brought all these spoils back to the Temple of Amun and he dedicated obelisks to Amun. Um, so he's really showing how much he cares about the god Amun and um, because Tutmosis was a fantastic warrior, a, a wonderful general. So he really um, had a lot to give to the god Armand because he, he went up to Syria and, and almost down to Ethiopia, spreading his empire. So a lot of spoils come back. There is a little bit of damage there, and some of it's quite interesting. You see in that top row, the heads of the necklaces have been damaged. And this is a mana damage because what there was was um, a god's head there that wasn't the arson. So these have been hammered out 
um, to, when uh, Arknarton came along and was removing uh, evidence of other gods and just leaving the Arton. Now, as you go further to the back of the temple, we've got the Hall of Records. We've got two lovely heraldic um, pillars with a lotus and a papyrus on the top of them for Upper and Lower Egypt. We have the uh, Sacred Bark Sanctuary. Now, this is sometimes called the Holy of Holies. And this is where the uh, boat or bark of the god would have uh, been placed and there would have been a shrine uh, in the middle of it. And you open the door to the shrine and there would have been the statue of Armon. This sanctuary that is there now is the one built by Alexander the Great and completed by his brother in brother. But there were previously sanctuaries there. So um Hatshepsut put one there, um Tutmosis put one there, but it it's a bit like you buy an old house and you remodel the kitchen. Every pharaoh that came along wanted to have his own um sanctuary in the middle of the Holy of Holies. Going further back, you get to the Middle Kingdom area of the temple. Now, there's hardly anything left at all, but there are some granite um, door stops that are, um, on the ground that you can just see, and they are all that's left of the Middle Kingdom parts of the temple. Further back, we have the Festival Hall of Tutmosis III, and this is where he celebrated his headset his anniversary of his coronation and the um, pillars are a rather peculiar shape. Apparently it's supposed to look like the tent poles of his campaigning. Um, a little, little more phallic to me, very odd. Now, that is the main part of the temple that you would normally go round in a guided tour on your Nile cruise, your first visit to Luxor. Now, actually, what I now want to do is to take you outside of this main area. So, where we have gone is from the quay along there to the Holy of Holies, and then you probably went out to the sacred lake and had a cup of tea in the cafe. But I want to take you all round the outside here. As you can see, it's a big site. Sorry about that. Um, and there's a lot to see here. So what we're going to start off with is the uh, excavations. We've got the open air museum. We've got the Temple of Ptah etc etc all going right the way around to the Khonsu temple so sit back enjoy now we're getting into hidden karma so the excavations now what they've been doing is excavating the front of the temple this is all part of putting a nice patio there and everything like that and um, Mansour Barak who's the, the head of uh, the SCA in Upper Egypt has been working there and they found a lot of stuff. Now, we've always known a little bit about the front of Karnak. This is from uh, a line drawing from a tomb, and you can see on the right-hand side there the um, pylon in front of the temple, and that there was a short canal and a basin and the quay, and that's how you got to the temple. But this uh, is not the Karnak that we see today. So people have always wondered exactly where this basin fitted and so forth. So these excavations at the front were a great opportunity to see what we could find out uh, about the truth of Neferhotep's picture. Now, if you want to find out more about these, these have been published, and do look for Mansour's name. There is also an absolutely excellent website. The French have been working there for years and decades. And if you go to that website, you can get a lot more information about the whole Karma, um, uh, the whole of the temple area. 
So there's been a, uh, a lot of digging going on. It's an Egyptian team. You can see them hard at work there. Uh, they are one of the few teams that keeps going all through the summer. Um, so, you know, well done them. I'm very, very impressed by their work. Um, this is the area that we're looking at. You can see those double ramps there. And what we're looking at is on the left hand side. Now, what on that model is shown as plain ground. Well, it's quite different. So, what they've discovered is the ramps, the embankment, the Roman bars, the Ptolemaic bars, and lots of objects. Lots of objects. So, here is the ramp today. It's behind the Avenue of Sphinxes. And you can see it's quite a wide ramp. And we, we think that this was used in some kind of, you know, welcoming Pharaoh here, come up the ramp, and uh, 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 sort of a, a big welcoming committee going along there. These are the bars. Aren't they amazing? Um, they, they've got mosaic floors um, with um, fish, and um, you can just see on the edge of the sea, as there that are dolphin shapes and um, the people would have sat in those bars with their feet in a, a sort of trough and poured water over themselves. There's me having a Roman bath. Um, I, I was actually sitting on reconstruction there. I was a bit nervous about actually sitting on the original stuff. But I was taken round there by the FDA. Please do not wander around this place. But um, uh, you can get permission to visit. And they are very proud of their excavation. So it, it, it is worth applying for permission. This is one of the uh, Egyptian Egyptologists. And you can see the work that he's doing. That he's found these pots in in the middle of this wall here, and he's excavating them. And some of them have actually got contents inside. But how brightly coloured they are, and how complete! I mean, they, these are really large pots. So he was very lucky to find them in in that condition. Um, the finds that they found, they found a huge cache of coins, which has been very, very interesting. Lots of pottery, obviously. Um, some gorgeous glass bracelets. And these are quite fascinating because um, they were broken and they were found in the drains. So um, Salah was speculating that what must have happened was the ladies were having a bath. They broke their bracelet and it got washed away. They found um, a gorgeous false door from a tomb on the west bank, um, some offering tables and iron um, and of course bronze nails but iron is quite significant because we are still in, in the end of the bronze age here. This is one of the little Roman bracelets, um, little glass bracelets, um, they're really cute aren't they? I, I, it was amazing to have it on my wrist. And this is the uh, full store. Um, it's a very, very good one. Now, Yus Arman was the uncle of Rex Murray. Now, in one of the later modules, I will talk about the tomb of Rex Murray, which is one of my favourite uh, tombs to go and see. Um, but Yus Arman was also in a very similar high, important position. Um, and, you know, he had a, a bob or two. Uh, hence this very uh, ornate red granite uh, full store with his name and his titles. It's very nicely done. What the heck is it doing over on the East Bank? Why, why did it get moved from its tomb? Um, these are questions that we, we just don't have the answer to, but we were very, very glad to have this wonderful object found. So the excavations there have um, helped us understand a lot about the temple. We now believe that lake of Neferhotep was underneath the Hyperstar Hall and that the Nile has moved from its current, uh, uh, from its location, it's, it's moved um, to where it is now. 
So uh, it used to be in the place where the security gate is now. Um, so it's moved quite away, which means as it's moved, more of the front of tarmac has been available for them to do other things, which is why the bars were built on that area. Quite interesting. Now we move on to another part. This is the Open Air Museum. Now I'm particularly fond of the Open Air Museum. If you're coming to Karnak and you're spending a lot of time there, um, the cafe is very expensive, but uh, if you bring a little picnic with you, it's quite a nice place to have a little picnic. And the uh, Cardians have been known to make the odd cup of tea before you, so um, quite a nice place to have a break. Um, part of the Open Air Museum is Lockyards. Now, I'm very fond of Lockyards because when you're trying to look at some of these carvings and they're, you know, 20, 30 feet in the air and you need binoculars and you're putting a crick in the neck, how much more pleasant it is to go into a Lockyard and see them all nicely laid out for you and you can get up right up close and personal. So there is a massive blockyard in front of the Ponsu Temple and there's another one in the Open Air Museum. And years ago, um, when I first came to Luxor, they had the Red Chapel of Hatshep sort all laid out in the Open Air Museum. But they have now reconstructed it. So you can see um, various bits being assembled and made into groups and things. Um, in the Open Air Museum, we have some rather unusual things. One of them is Aunt Narton shown in a typical smiting pose. Now, he often gets a reputation as a pacifist, uh, pharaoh. So this um, uh, smiting pose, where he's holding on the hair of his enemies and he's about to club their brains out, is uh, quite interesting to see. Um, contradicting that uh, impression of them quite a lot. There's a chapel of Tutmosis the Fourth. No, fourth. Tutmosis the Fourth is the guy responsible for the dream stay lay between the paws of the Sphinx down at the Giza pyramids. Uh, we also have a chapel of Amon Hotep the First. So also reconstructed um, from from bits and pieces that they found. So this is a rock yard. This is the Konsu rock yard. As you can see, it is absolutely massive. And um, you, you, some of it is, is uh, sort of architectural pieces, but some of it is hieroglyphics. And if you are a student of hieroglyphics, a wonderful place to go round and uh, do your studies. Uh, it's very, very large. Um, you can just see the, the main body of the temple behind it. Here is some of the bits being assembled together. You see those five in the centre of the picture. They belong together so they've put them um, next to each other so you can get more of an idea of how things work. Massive jigsaw. Um, now this is one of the, the things that they've uh, reassembled. This is at the entrance to the Open Air Museum. You can see it's blocked yard to the left. Now, what they've done is they've made two copies of uh, obelisks um, uh, just out of cement. So you can see how that chapel worked, how it was held together by the um, uh, uh, sort of, you know, it wasn't freestanding. Um, and when you go inside it, you'll be a little confused because the figures are on their side. And this is because this chapel was reused by Ramses II and it put up as a stele in front of the, the Mut temple. So when they reconstructed it, did they reconstruct the Ramses II stele or did they reconstruct the original chapel? It's a bit of a dilemma. So they, they went for reconstructing the original chapel, but that means that these uh, late carvings are now lying on their sides. This is one of the um, nicer pieces in the Open Air Museum, and older pieces. This is Sanusha I. He is um, 
a middle kingdom pharaoh and so you're probably talking about a thousand years before everything else that you have seen in the Karnak area this was carved and look how beautiful it is now do you remember that awful Ramses carving that I showed you and then look at this I mean isn't it exquisite um, the lightness the delicacy of the release there um, Sinistra really had some great stone carvers this is what was in the place that the Hyperstar Hall is now. It's a, a portico of Tutmosis the Falls, and this is being reassembled in that open air museum there. So you can see, um, you know, what it looked like at the time, and you, you can see there's quite a lot of colour left on the stonework there. Um, here's Tutmosis making you an offering. See, very nicely coloured with the long kilt here and looking through uh, the Tutmosis the fourth pillars you can see the red chapel of Hatshepsut um, the bottom is black granite the rest of it is red granite and uh, it is carved with scenes of Hatshepsut and Tutmosis the third offering to the gods as they process down. Now the interesting thing about it, you can see here, there is Hatshepsut, there is Tutmosis, and there's no damage. So this thing that guides tell you about in the white hot heat of anger after he ascended the throne, he smashed up everything to do with Hatshepsut, is um disproved if you like by this chapel because obviously for quite a period of time um he didn't do this and then he decided to put his own chapel up in the uh, sanctuary so this was moved chopped up used as hardcore and it was after that that the defacement of Hatshepsut took place so uh, scholars nowadays believe that this was uh, a cold, hard political decision rather than uh, a white-hot resentment of him, Hatshepsut keeping him off the throne. Um, I, I personally believe that Hatshepsut and Tutmosis worked well together. Uh, he was army mad, hot-headed, testosterone-driven prince, wanted to go out there and kill a few Hittites, and he could, because he had this completely reliable admin person looking after things for him, Hatshep Um And, uh, yeah, I think that thing of them working together really works well. And then when she died, he took over, and he was ready to settle down by then. But later on, something happened. Maybe there was another female around, and he wanted to make it quite clear that only boys could inherit, so he destroyed all evidence of Hatshepsut. Anyway, an interesting period, and it will be nice to learn more about that as more and more things get discovered. Now, this is the gem of the museum. Uh, if it ever goes missing when you go there and you find it's not there, it's because it's in my garden, because I'd love to steal it. Oh, it's gorgeous. It is so gorgeous. This is also Sinus at the first. So, you know, we're talking a thousand years before the other stuff. And it is the most exquisite carving in the world. It's a little chapel that would have been used as a way station, so they come up ramp rest the bark of the god on that little altar in the, in the middle and then go out the other side but look at the carvings look at them and you can see the detail that they have gone into there every single feather is shown at the on the wing case of that beetle um the, just here that wing case there you can see all the lines of the wing cases. It is totally, totally exquisite. And it was chopped up and used as hardcore inside the pylons. Modern day Egyptologists discovered it 
put it in the Open Air Museum. Eventually it was reconstructed and it was put on display. And isn't it gorgeous? Not only is it gorgeous, it's an extremely practical piece of documentation. What you've got along the bottom are standards, and then you have the names of the gnomes, and underneath that, that outer picture, you have the length of the Nile um, of that gnome. So every year, uh, the inundation would come down, flood all the fields, and all your boundaries would be wiped away, but this enabled you to reconstruct all those factories. So not only is it gorgeous, it's practical as well. Egyptians, I love them. Now, we're moving on again. This is uh, the Patar Temple. Um, it's in the North Karnak area. And it's uh, as you go towards it, you go past the chapels to the gods' wives of almonds. Uh, I'm going to show you how you identify a, a Ptolemaic cartouche as opposed to a New Kingdom, Patmosis III cartouche, and it's dedicated to Patar, Sekhmet, and Nefertum. Now, North Karnak, come out of the Hyperstar Hall, which is here. And then you walk up to the Patar temple there. That's why I say this model is really, really helpful. And on the way, you see these little chapels. Now, the God's Wives of Armen, um, this was in a, a later period. Um, we're, we're talking 25th, 26th dynasty. And um, Thebes had become a bit of a law unto itself. And what the pharaohs were doing at that period of time was making their eldest daughter a god's wife of Armen, and um, she had the power in the Theban area. Um, so Pharaoh down in Memphis was able to keep control of Thebes. Um, and you can see that by the fact that they could have their own little chapels in Tarnak. They've also got them uh, at Medneheb. And these are some of the little chapels, very, very beautiful, nice pillars, um, very ruined, currently being worked on, reconstructed and drawn, so you may find them closed off as you go past, it depends on your luck, um, whether you can get anywhere close and have a look at them, but they are rather interesting. The, uh, uh, there's several of them. Um, and here you can see her carving. Now, notice it's not quite as good as our uh, New Kingdom and um, Middle Kingdom carving. Her face looks a bit distorted there. Um, these later periods don't always get it as good as the earlier ones did. Now we reach the uh, Patar Temple itself. It's in two halves. The front half is Ptolemaic and the back half is New Kingdom. Uh, Ptolemaic, how do you identify Ptolemaic? Well, they loved fancy capitals, and you can see they're extremely fancy capitals there. Um, very, very pretty floral um, decoration, um, and that, that is just in front of the New Kingdom part of the temple. Here is a bit more Ptolemaic decoration. Now, um, I described Ptolemaic decoration as somebody got given a, an icing gun for Christmas and they want to try every single nozzle out because it's very, very, very busy. You hardly get a square inch of space left. They they fill it up completely. So this, this sort of gives you a, a clue that it's Ptolemaic. The other clue is the cartouches. You see here, it's a very crowded cartouche. There are loads of hieroglyphics in there. And this is because Ptolemaic names aren't natural ancient Egyptian names. So they were transliterated into hieroglyphics. So, you, you, you know, you spell it out, Cleopatra, you know, Ptolemy. You, you can't just do it um, with three or four hieroglyphics to get the name in there. So this is a clue 
if you're looking at Ptolemaic decoration. Whereas if you look at New Kingdom decoration, do you see there's lots of white space there in between the um, figures of the god and the hieroglyphics there. It's, uh, it just doesn't look quite as busy, does it? And look at this cartouche. You see there's only three hieroglyphs in there. So much easier to, to read. It's, it's obvious that this was a natural ancient Egyptian name because three hieroglyphs would depict it. Now, the sanctuary, the central sanctuary, is dedicated to Ptah. Um, he is a mummiform god. He's the creator god down at Memphis. And he is in the north part of the Karnak temple because he is normally in the north part of Egypt. The left-hand sanctuary would have been dedicated to Nephetum, and there's no statue in there at all. Um, poor Ptah has lost his head here, but it very obviously is him. But the next door sanctuary is dedicated to Sekhmet, um, the female of the triad, and um, a very, very nice statue. If you're lucky, the guardians will do this little trick where they go on the roof with a mirror and sunshine and you go in the darkened sanctuary and they send down a shaft of sunlight to light up Sekhmet. And it's fairly amazing. And um, uh, the mystery, the mystique of Egypt really comes alive. And if you're lucky, you are the only person seeing it because the Qatar temple is very rarely visited. Now we're going to another part. This is the botanical room. So we, we've gone round the north part and we're now going right over to the east of the Karnak area. This is by Thutmosis III. Now, when Napoleon uh, came to Egypt, he brought a number of scientists with him and they created Description de l'Egypt, which is an absolutely gorgeous book, um, lots of lithographs in it, showing all the things that they saw, the wonderful monuments and the flora and the fauna. I think Thutmose III is like Napoleon in more than one way. He wasn't only a brilliant general like Napoleon, but he also had a scientific bent. And the botanical room is our reason for believing this. On the walls of this rear part of the temple, he has depicted odd fruits, flowers, animals that he saw on his travels as a general, um, which makes him a character that you'd really rather quite like to know a little bit more about. Here are some of the animals. And isn't the carving, I mean, quite difficult to get good photos here because you've got to get the light in exactly the right place. But isn't it amazing, the, um, the you know, the, the quality of this carving here. It's, it's a small little room, but very, very interesting. Now, to the side of it is this thing. Now, you see they've reconstructed a niche here. And it's long and low, not tall and thin. So there wasn't a statue that went in there. So what it went in a long, low niche. And you have an offering table in the middle. And it's part of the botanical. I think this is the world's first museum. This is a personal thing. I think these are display cases. And either the dead object or maybe even the living specimens of these things depicted on the walls was in these long, low niches. Um, I, of course, could be wrong, but, you know, what other explanation for a long, low niche? Um, now we're going a bit further east and south of Karnak. So this is the area we're going to now. Um, this is the back of the temple here. So we've come out, of the botanical room is just there. Oops. Um, and you've got the sacred lake 
um, and in fact the cafe is just by here so that's where you are in that um, now the uh, back of this temple um, has got some special things of its own this is called the temple of the hearing ear and people um, depicted ears here because the gods were listening to their prayers um, so a very interesting part of the Karnak area this is part of the temple that would probably have been more accessible to the common man um, he uh, would have uh, you know paid the priest probably a sacrifice and had his prayer dedicated up to the gods um, further along underneath the sound and light stage um, we've been talking gods 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 pharaoh 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 but there were a lot of priests and where did they live well the high priests the important guys lived here and you can see this mud brick house just underneath the sound and light stage um, at the back of the sacred lake you see the sacred lake in the foreground there uh, there's a row of seven houses um, they were pricey top, mo uh, top models here you know we've got um, the use of stone it, now stone is only used very rarely in living accommodation it was all mud brick but we have stone doorways we have stone columns the rooms are quite large and um, the houses were quite practical they had thick walls so um, you know nice and cool in summer and warm in winter here is uh, one of the doorways. You can see the stone lintel and the, the uprights there. This is the interior of one of the rooms. There were two rooms and then we have a flight of stairs going up. Whether there was a second floor or whether they just had a flat roof, we don't know. But even if they just had a flat roof, it would have made this a very large uh, dwelling place. Uh, Egyptians, even modern Egyptians, tend to sleep outdoors in the summer on the roofs to get the cool breezes. Um, and here we have a very nicely proportioned stone column, making this room into quite a you know luxurious place. And you can see how thick the walls are here. Um, that these, um, even though on a hot sunny day, if you're just standing in the shade of them, it's so much cooler. So when they were roofed and, um, uh, you know, it's slightly up the hill, a bit of cooling breeze just by the lake, I think it would have been quite pleasant actually to live here. Now we're looking at the south axis of Karnak. Um, you've got the um, south going there and the east-west going there um, and it was a row of several pylons going along and you've also got the jubilee temple of Amenhotep II there so this for example is the eighth pylon with some nice colossal statues in front of it and um, it's very ruined now in the center of these pylons along this access is where a lot of this stuff from the open air museum comes from uh, this is the jubilee temple of Amon Hotep II you can't always get access here but you know with a bit of you know I can give you guidance about how you can sneak around and get in here not closed off exactly but you know there's ways of getting at it that nobody bothers about and ways of getting at it where everybody shouts at you. Um, quite an interesting little temple. Um, you can see the carvings there. Now this is again a mana damage. Do you see here how the um, uh, um, headdress of the god Armon is sort of echoed? This is because um, it was cut away and then recarved after the Amarna damage. So the pharaoh on the left hand side, the background is completely flat, but on the right hand side you see it's slightly dished 
because it was damaged by Arknarton during the Amarna period when he was removing all traces of Armand, and then it was recarved later at the Restoration. So um, the stone has sort of been worn away there. Um, also on the southern side, we have the Honsu Temple. Now, when you go to Karnak, you are mostly seeing the Arman Temple. The Muth Temple is currently closed, but I understand they are hoping to open it in the next couple of years. But the Khonsu Temple is open, nobody goes there. So um, the, this is a triad of Arman, Mut and Khonsu. So it's well worth going to the Khonsu Temple because it's not quite as confusing as Karnak. Karnak's been extended by a lot of people and they've knocked down a bit and they've put up a bit. But the Khonsu Temple is more cohesive as a temple design. Now, Honsu um, can be shown as a young boy. He's mummy form, so his legs are together. He has what's called the forelock of youth, where part of his hair is plaited coming down like this. Um, and he holds the scepters for life, power and stability. But he can also be portrayed as a falcon. Um, and there are a lot of falcon gods. There's uh, Horus, often with the double crown. There's Montu with a sun disc and double feathers. And there's Ra Harakti with just double feathers. So how do you know if it's Honsu or not? Because he'll have a round disc on his head, but he will also have the moon crescent underneath it. So that's when you see the moon disc and the moon present, you know it's the falcon, in this case, is Honsu. Now this is the location of the Honsu temple, on uh, the south part of the temple. Uh, it has an avenue of sphinxes that leads all the way to Luxor temple. And this is currently going to be, this is currently under excavation. And eventually, this whole avenue will be open. Next door to the Honsu Temple is the Opet Temple. And this is currently closed and being uh, uh, conserved and uh, cleaned. But um, inshallah, will be open again soon. Um, and what would have happened is that the Arman would have processed from his temple past the Khonsu Temple, along this avenue of Sphinxes, all the way to Luxor Temple, to be invigorated. Um, I think you might be able to guess from the way I said that how he was invigorated. This was a, a very, um, you know, the gods' wives of Armen had something to do with this. And then he comes back to Karnak, all invigorated, and does another year. So this OPEC festival is terribly important and is still celebrated today. Um, you still see uh, festivals here called Mulis, where they have boats um, going along, processing in the streets. And this is a remnant of the OPEC festival. But now we're going to go into the Konsu Temple. Now the first thing you see is that gateway. Now that gateway is Ptolemaic. And then you have the rest of the temple. This is part of the Ptolemaic Gateway. And you, it's just recently been cleaned. I, I mean really recently. This was just taken uh, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, they've just uh, scrubbed it up basically and um, removed all the soot damage and everything and revealed all these lovely, lovely colours. Um, really excellent. Note the crowded cartouches. Note the busy, busy decoration. Um, so the Khonsu Temple was started by Ramses III. Uh, so, well, he built it, but it was possibly begun by Amen Hotep III. Um, but then it was completed by all these other guys right down to Augustus Caesar. Now, Herihor, the high priest of Armen, uh, this is when the Theban area was getting a little bit above itself and thinking that it was a rival with Pharaoh. 
So Harry Hall was the high priest of Armand underneath the unsuited one. This is the first pylon. This is in very good condition, as you can see, it's, it's completely complete. And it's got the uh, sphinxes outside it. Um, there is some work going on cleaning and restoring it in there, and I'll go into that in a minute. Uh, this is the results of it. Look at this lovely colour on the Peristar Hall, um, the columns going round the courtyard, and they can be re revealed to be very, very colourful, very beautiful. Um, this is the Hyperstar Hall, and through there you can see the sanctuary right at the back. There's the sanctuary um, with the altar right in the middle. Now, this normally would have been covered. This is the smallest, darkest place, and you um, would have come here to um, worship the uh, statue of the god Khonsu and um, to lay offerings in front of it. Um, the uh, uh, floor is rising slightly, the roof is coming down, and you would have been sort of overawed by being in the God's secret place. Now, here you can see the moon with the moon crescent uh, below it. And you can see down below, you see Armin with his double feathers and the little boy behind with the moon and the moon crescent. And then on the other side, Armin would look behind and Pharaoh offering to him. So he is very much a moon god, and they're all worshipping the moon there. Now, I said about the work that was going on here. They've actually got a field school going on in this area um, by the American Research Council in Egypt, and they have been training young Egyptian archaeologists how to um, record, document, conserve, clean, everything that they need to know. And they have been using this uh, temple as a way of showing them how to do it properly. And um, it's a great initiative and the young Egyptians are really keen to learn as much as possible. Here you can see what they, they've done. The Italians have shown them. They've taken a small square and they've cleaned that bit and now that whole chapel has been cleaned, but they uh, have been sort of training them up exactly how to do the best possible cleaning. And you notice how the white really comes out there, um, and it's a bit murky uh, below, um, but isn't that gorgeous? Now, don't forget the whole temple would have been coloured like this. Um, it would have been really, really, really beautiful. So that's the end of our biggest module. Sorry about that, that it was so long, but Carnet Temple is so massive, there's so much to see. Um, I really think you could spend two or three days just doing Carnac. Um, so uh, apologies for keeping you for so long. Um, the next modules are not as long. And see you on the next one, Luxor Temple.